Getting started in any game can be daunting, especially action RPGs that differentiate themselves with complex systems and slight twists on an existing formula. In this video today, I'll be giving you a step-by-step -step walkthrough of the start of Last Epoch for beginners, so that you can better understand many of the systems that are being thrown at you all at once. While the game is not very complex, the systems can be a bit daunting because there is a definite ton of transparency with the information in the game, which can lead to a bit of analysis paralysis. I've done something a bit different with this beginner's guide, as this definitely is my first rodeo. Rather than me just delivering every bit of information, I've created this video as a sort of play along guide. So once you've created your character, you can just simply press play on this video and I'll talk about information as it is unlocked or discovered in the game. This way, when you reach certain bits, you can just simply press play, pause, go back to the game, rinse and repeat. Now, this is your first time my channel. The way I do things is by upgrading the knowledge of my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. Now, with a beginner's guide, that's a little difficult to do. So instead, I've just provided chapters in the timeline and description covering every single topic we'll be going over today. Pretty familiar with the game, but you know, don't understand a specific mechanic, no big deal, just navigate to the part that interests you the most. If you've taken a look below and nothing stands out or you're a veteran of the long war, then please feel free to shut the video down and get back to enjoying Last Epoch. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe if you found this video helpful, as that does help me out in a huge, huge way. You can also find a link to my existing Last Epoch guides in the description at the end of the video if you need help with any other subject. But let's get started here on my ultimate beginner's guide to Last Epoch in 2024. We've just booted our character up. Let's go through the UI and just kind of talk through some things. Now, the first thing to kind of take a look at is right here at the bottom. These are all of our abilities, right? And right now, of course, we don't really have any other ones that we can put into these slots, but we have Q through R on your keyboard and then right click. Now, if you're using a controller, it's going to be fully built around whatever the controller buttons are. I'm sure that's like what are A, B, whatever the hell, Y, X, whatever it is for whatever controller configuration you've got. But you can swap all those, of course, going into settings and oop, going into settings. Then go and change input keys here in gameplay. And you'll be able to change all those if you so wish. So if you want these to be one, two, three, and four, like any other type of game, or if you want that just to be one, two, three, four, and five, you can go ahead and do that. But if maybe, for example, you want this to be um, a different button here, you can do that. So whatever you want to set up, however you want to set up, you can just go ahead and set those things up. Now, outside of that, we can go ahead and press I and go into our inventory. This is, of course, got every single corresponding item slot you would see. You're going to see the ability to sort items, gifting, which you can gift pieces of your inventory. This is only going to be relevant if you're playing with friends. You can gift your friends within a certain amount of period if you've been playing with them. There are also things called resonances. Resonance drop when you've played alongside a player for an extended period of time. Using a resonance on an item will enable it to be gifted to that player even if they were not present when the item dropped. This allows you, if you're like, say, playing with specific friends, like, hey, you know, you weren't here today, so I went ahead and, and played a little bit, but I don't worry, I got some good drops, I'll use the resonance. Got that right there. But for the most part, you're not really going to worry about this. You've got your um, gold tab, your transfer materials button, which is going to take all materials in your inventory and put them up here into your crafting materials section, which you're going to simply press this button, and you can see all of your prefixes, your suffixes, or just any affixes, all of your glyphs, and all of your modifier runes. These are going to become more important as you play through and you'll be able to search them. This is going to become a huge, huge portion of your like kind of additional inventory. Then you have all of your idle slots. It's worth noting just by looking at this, you can see all of these are unlockable except for this one right in the dead center. You've got your blessings. This tab is only going to be relevant once you reach the end of the campaign and you start doing your first monoliths and you've got your appearance tab. Now, your appearance tab is going to be all these sort of cosmetic items you maybe got from pre-ordering, whatever it is, it's all going to be here in this tab. You can also, you know, use the microtransaction shop if you want. All this crap is all cosmetic, so don't even worry about it if you don't want it. It's, it's just, I'm just pointing it out as part of, like, you know, consistency. But outside of that, we have our potion bottles in the lower left corner. As you can see here, the health restored is equal to 50 plus 5x character level. So for example, 55 at level one and 550 at level 100. And slain enemies have a chance to drop potions, which you pick up. And when you pick up a potion, it will immediately heal you if you're low on health. So it's kind of a nice little uh, thing to have there. Your mana, of course, and then these little buttons. Now, this button I think currently is broken, but in the previous versions of the game, you could actually click this button and select one of your abilities. 
it would then populate this little section right here. And by doing that, if you held down shift, it would automatically use that ability. I don't know why it's not working. There's some sort of issue with it right now, but it for some reason it's it's not there. In the future, perhaps it will. At the bottom too, we have your experience bar. You can see, of course, it's very transparent. And also we have some other tabs. P brings up all of your passive system. So gaining passives, of course, are gonna push you across this bar. We're gonna have our own section on that. So you've got that right here with your respective masteries as you see fit. S is gonna bring up all of your skills as you would imagine so. So all of your skills that are unlocked by simply being a set level of your character. You've got your ones that are unlocked by going through your specific character's passive tree and then the respective mastery trees over here. If you see these icons, that corresponds to what is called a mastery skill. So even though you can invest points into other masteries, again, we'll go into that in more detail later, you can, you, these are abilities you'll only get from having that mastery. For example, if I'm a rune master, I, it's the only way I can get runic invocation is by being a rune master. If I'm a spell blade, I can get flame rush and frost wall from rune master, but I'll never be able to get runic invocation because it is a mastery skill. So if you're playing a druid, that's how you get a werebear, for example. And at the top here, we have our one, two, three, four, five specialization slots that unlock at 4, 8, 20, 35, and 50. Once we unlock one of those, we're going to go through them. I'm going to try to basically, like I said before, create the same path that you're going to go through together with you. And if you get lost at any point, you don't know what the hell to do. I don't remember any of the buttons you said. You press this little thing, and it's got all of it. You've got your character screen, which we are about to go into. You've got your inventory, your skills, your passive, your forge, your map, your factions, which we'll have a whole section on, your loot filter, all that stuff is all right through here. And if you get lost further from that, you've got your game guide where you can jump into any single subject matter that we cover in this video, or maybe I'd miss entirely. It's all right there for you. So let's go back to that, to that character menu. So character menu is going to be super transparent here. It's pretty much all of your stats, all of your resistances, your movement speed, your health, your mana and then additional defenses. So like block chance, stun avoidance, block effectiveness, dodge. Um, and then furthermore, you have tabs that correspond to different modifiers for your character. So for example, let's say this character is going to be a rune master. I'm going to focus primarily on cold or on lightning and fire damage. Well, increased lightning damage is right here and increased fire damage is right here. So I'm going to be able to look at those things and say, okay, cool. I like that. I like that. Well, what about my defense? Well, what, what the hell is ward decay threshold? We'll hover over it and it gives me the exact readout of exactly what that is. And a for instance, right? So for example, if you have a ward decay, blah, 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 it's going to give you any information you need. I'm not going to go through every single one of these because it's going to be build dependent and it's going to waste a lot of time. So if you kind of think to yourself, well, I, I kind of wonder how much crit strike avoidance do I need? How important is it? Just hover over it, read it. It's going to give you all the information you need. Same thing here for minions, and if you're playing um, a necromancer, if you're playing a beast master, if you're playing a falconer, if you're playing a forge guard, or any other character that would use lots of minions, it's all going to be right here for you. And then other is going to be stuff like bleed chance, mana efficiency, slow chance, typically any kind of chance is in this section. As you can see, potion slots increased from belts, anything like that is all right here. That is your character tab. Another big subject I want to talk on real quick is loot filters. And loot filters are very important. They're probably the, one of the most important things in this game. And you can go ahead and make your own if you want. They're not that hard to make. A simple guide on this, which I'll be creating, will help you out. But the principle behind it pretty much is you anything that is in a rule, uh, anything above that rule is has precedent. So in this case, you know, it says filter functions by creating rules and ordering them. Rules located higher in the list take priority over rule rules below them. In this case, wolf helmets were shown because the rule is located above hide all helmets. So you can hide all helmets, and maybe you're just looking for specific wolf helmets. Well, now you're, there you go. Whatever it is, you can go ahead and create that filter or import. So the best way to probably do it is by pasting for the clipboard, clipboard contents. Um, just go ahead and type in the character you want to play and it's mastery. So maybe for example, mage rune master, or just simply rune master loot filter, and you'll find one on max roll, you'll find one on last epoch tools, you'll find any number of videos, and people usually link you to their uh, loot filters. You take that, you paste it to the clipboard, and it will come through just like this. So you've got it, it's all set, and then you can toggle that by holding down X. Holding it down, you can see in the lower left corner, it says enabled, disabled, unable, disabled. Hold that button down, and you're good to go. So that gives you a crash course on the UI. Let's go ahead and go through some levels here until we get to our first skill specialization.
You've gotten some levels and you now have your first passive point. Let's go into passives and how they work. Now, of course, it's exactly what they are. They're passive that are just going to passively increase your character. <laughs> and essentially, you're going to invest upon them across this entire spectrum. And if you look at these little chains, sometimes you'll see these little ones. It says requires one point. Or over here, you'll see it requires three points. The little nodules will repeat itself when we go into skills in a little bit. But what I just kind of want you to take mind of is the fact that you're going to need to invest 20 points into this initial passive tree to unlock all of the abilities at the bottom. You're going to want to always do this for all of your characters because you want to get all of these skills down here at the bottom. Um, the max level is level 100, so you're going to have quite a few passives. And it's not, like, not necessarily a one-to-one -one there. You're going to get passives from a whole lot of other sources. And what's important, too, to know is just kind of approach this in the note that like you know hey i have a build in mind and maybe i want to focus on i'm going to type in the tupper upper the tupperware the light the, the upper right corner here lightning okay well now i know these are all the abilities that are going to increase some way shape or form lightning or they have lightning referenced in them and on my first point i'm going to put it right here because i'm going to go ruin master and i'm going to want to cycle my elemental damage and i'm going to focus primarily on cold and lightning uh fire and lightning um so <laughs> I've got those right there. And if there's any instance where you're kind of a little confused on something for these passives, hold down Alt, and it'll tell you. But sometimes these passives will say something like, okay, uh, well, uh, when you hit an enemy with a fire skill, you ignite additional nearby enemies. Hold down Alt. And it's gonna show me a little bit more details here. There are sometimes it'll, t it'll say like, oh, you know, this will do like a lightning strike or something. I don't know, I'm, I'm, making, I'm making up some, some example of something, but usually, You'll find something that's underlined. You can't hover over it, unfortunately, but holding down Alt will give you more information. And that is kind of pertinent for not just simply this screen, but when we jump into skills, it'll be way more transparent because there's a lot of times you're going to see skills. Okay, this skill will now do this. You hold down Alt and it's going to give you that information. But once you invest these 20 points, you're going to have unlocked all of these skills at the bottom that you can then use with your character. And it's now important to note that when you jump into your mastery, Let's just say Rune Master, because that's what I'm going to go with this character. I'll be able to jump into this whenever I see fit. If you're worried about your mastery, what level do I get it? It is bound to the campaign. Just simply play through the, the campaign story. You should get it around level 15, 16, 17. And your mastery will just, the campaign's going to say, hey, now you select a mastery. And you choose one. That mastery is set. We have a whole set of section on masteries ahead, but it's just worth noting for passives, you can invest 20 points in any of the mastery trees, even if you're not specializing in that mastery. You just won't get, like I said earlier, the mastery skill down here, and you won't get access to the kind of keystone things at the very end, capstone stuff at the end of the mastery in specific. But you will get, you know, for example here, static orb and ice barrage. And you can get any of the benefits. Like I said, maybe I'm going really hard on the paint on lightning. Well, I can go here for some increased lightning damage per point, and shock chance with lightning skills is increased. And same thing here, lightning penetration, lightning damage leech. So just know that you do, you're not necessarily fully locked into your mastery as far as spelling points. You can spend those points in other mastery trees if you want. Just also don't spread yourself too thin. But have fun with this. Yeah, you can min-max and go fucking look up a guide online and have that thing completely do it all for you. By all means, do it. I do that too. But... I also want to encourage you to explore this game for yourself and go through this passive tree in a way that makes sense for you and the way you want to play. You paid, mo you paid money for this game, so enjoy it how you want. And when you get to the end game and maybe your build's not really pushing the uh, top tier of stuff, then go find that, that min maxi sweaty uh, guide. But have fun in the meantime. Explore. Find things that work for you. Maybe you, want, you went into this going, I'm going to go lightning, but man, cold is just so damn fun. So that's how our passives work. Let's jump into a talk on our skills next. So we're about to hit level four and talk about our first skill specialization because currently right now we're level three. All right, you've hit level four. It's time to talk about skill specializations. Don't mind my little astral fox here. Um, and remember too, by simply clicking this, you can swap out any skills in any location. You can have skills bound to the same thing. Like I've got my fireball here on right click and also on W, it doesn't really matter, but it's just kind of worth noting. You can just kind of swap these out if you haven't done that already. Also to note, you see this little guy right here, this little node above snap freeze. Uh, this is telling me that it has like a recycle. So I'm gonna use it and look, it's got a recycle. 
versus you know elemental nova here i can just hold down r and use it as as, as long as i've got the mana to do it so if you see that little node there, it's just telling you that it needs to go through some sort of cooldown to be used again. But now, let's talk about those skills. So you'll get this little padlock, you go ahead and press this button, and you see this pop up here in the upper left, well, I guess the dead center. And you're going to get skill specializations at 8, 20, 35, and 50. And it is very common if you're following a build guide or something that they tell you, play with these skills up to this level. Once you get a mastery unlocked, then go over those skills with this skill. That's very common. So don't think of jumping into a skill specialization as locking yourself into a skill for any set period of time. I'm going to show you why. So the first skill I'm going to specialize in here is Fireball. And from this screen, we can see, and just to kind of show you this too, you don't need to put the skill up here in the specialization slot to see its kind of talent tree, as it were. If I go back and click on Elemental Nova, I can do the same thing. You can see here, uh, this tells me in the uh, that I've got one point to spend on the skill specialization. If in the middle of combat the skill levels up, you'll see it down here in the corner. It'll appear, the little window, little icon of that skill will be right there telling you, hey, you click it, it brings you immediately into the skin, uh, the, <laughs> oh god, the screen, <laughs> to spend your specialization point. So what does this all mean? Well, look at this screen here. Take a look at this photograph. And um, every time I do, it makes me laugh. But when you look at these, these circles are basically passive additions to the skill in some way, shape, or form. Adept. Fire, fireball has increased cast speed. Plus 5% cast speed per point. But when you look at these, what is that? A hexagon? Yeah, six sides. <clears throat> this is some sort of change or mutation or additional ability to the skill. So Unchained Fire. Fireball has increased cast speed and deals more damage for each extra projectile, multiplicative with other modifiers, but no longer fires extra projectiles. So there's always either going to be some sort of trade-off or it kind of morphs the skill in a specific way so that it changes the way that it operates or some of the things that you've done leading up to it now change. It, there's all sorts of little things here. So for example, over here, Fire Spray, Fireball releases additional projectiles that, projectiles that fire in a cone when cast, but cost more mana. Or this one down here. Half of Fireball's fire base damage is converted to lightning. Consequently, this portion of this of its damage scales with increased to lightning damage, but not increased to fire damage. Fireball gains lightning tag. Fireball also gains additional crit strike multiplier. So you see the trade-off here, right? No longer does it scale with fire and now scales with lightning. This is now a, fi a lightning ability and not a fire ability. And that's the cool thing about this game in general. You can just change all of your abilities, which I love. But one final example will be Flame Burst. Hitting the same enemy with several fireballs triggers a Flame Burst around them. Remember I said that sometimes you're going to see these situations where it has an underlying situation? Uh, that's a lot of words, like situation. This isn't Jersey Shore. But hold down Alt, and it shows you what Flame Burst is. Because otherwise you're going to look at this and go, what does that mean? And you're going to try to hover over it and get pissed off like I did. But now I know Flame Burst is a burst of flame that deals high damage in an area around the target. Seven mana cost. 230 DPS because it's going to be based off of whatever modifiers I've got active for the scaling tags below that. I'm going to go into that in its own section just a little bit. But this is a way to kind of go through this, this character and kind of decide for yourself how you're going to go about this, right? Like I said, choose some sort of narrative or thread for the skills you want to have. You know what? I'm really digging the whole fire damage thing. So I can just do this and yeah, obviously all this is going to say fire, right? But have fun with this and go through it and say, well, yeah, maybe I want this to do more projectiles. And maybe at the very end of it, I want this crit chance to now go to a stun chance. Um, whatever you want it to kind of do, just look at these icons, take a little bit of time, take a beat, and, and figure out a path for yourself. Or maybe, like I said, you want to focus on lightning. Well, now you have the ability to just turn the damn thing into lightning over here. Or over here, you know, fireball hits have additional fire penetration and lightning penetration. You can have a lot of fun with this. Morph this as you see fit. And it's worth noting, though, that once you've decided, hey, you know what? I'm going to actually step back here and not use Fireball. I'm going to respect this. We go ahead and press this button. And we have two options. A, we can remove a skill point. Remove spent points of your choosing in the skill tree. Each point removed will reduce the skills level by one if above your minimum skill level. Level up the skill as normal to spend these points again. What that means is, let's say this thing is up to level 20. And I want to remove a point. Like, let's say we went down this tree into lightning into plasma ball, and we just didn't want to do it. We press respec, we press remove points, and we click back the skills that we do not want. 
And if we're at level 20, we will lose a level for every time we do that down to our minimum specialized skill level, which is right here. At this level one, obviously it's gonna be level one. But if you're level 75, which my main character is, that level is six. So if I'm level, if I despecialize this thing all the way down to its base, it'll still retain level six. So I can still kind of go crazy with it. And keep in mind too, that if you do that, it, is an, it has increased experience to come back up to its parent level. So don't think of despecking like, oh man, I'm really gonna set my character back. No, it's gonna take like a, maybe an hour or two of play time to jump back up to like level 20. It's not that, not that long when you're at the max level. So don't worry about it. And even then you're leveling up through the game. So don't worry about it. And then of course there's despecialize the skill, which is completely removing the skill from the specialization slot and being able to put another skill in the specialization slot. Let's just go ahead and do it real quick. We'll put Elemental Nova in there, and now we can do Elemental Nova. And the Elemental Nova will go up to the minimum specialized skill level of whatever it is at the time that you do it. So, for example, 75, minimum skill level 6. So, Elemental Nova would be level 6 right now in this instance. So, we're good right there. I'm going to go back to putting my Fireball into this situation over here, and I wanted to do, yeah, Speed and Range. But, let's talk very quickly about our skills themselves and how to scale them. So, jumping back to this screen we have our skills at the bottom. And pretty much everything in this game is revealing, is gonna reveal more information to you whenever you use Control and Alt. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and hover over Fireball. You can see right here, it does damage per second, mana cost, and it has scaling tags. What those scaling tags mean is you're gonna be able to increase its damage from any one of those three modifiers. Increases fire damage by a set percentage, increases spell damage, increases to your intelligence. Anything like that is gonna then increase Fireball. Added spell damage applies at 125% effectiveness and has a 40% chance to ignite on hit. You can see all those things at the top of the screen. But if I hold down Alt, I get more information. Intelligence scales this thing at 12% increased damage, 4% per point. If I had a minion, which I don't think there's any minions that I can use at all as a, as a mage, I'm almost positive. Uh, just to make sure. I, I know that there's, there's kind of like a minion that you get as a... Uh, as a, uh, what the hell am I called, uh, a rune master down here? But I don't think, yeah. If minions, would you hold down alt, and it shows you tons more information, too, for minions, where it shows you, hey, here's how their damage scales based off of your capabilities. And just another example here would be Glacier. Scaling tags, cold, spell, area, intelligence. And you can see there's so much more information here, because Glacier is a three-stage ability. It has an ability where it shoots smaller, bigger, and then a biggest Glacier. It shoots three successively larger Ice explosion, as it says. And its intelligence scales with increased damage, 4% per point, and gain 12% freeze multiplier, 4% per point. But added damage is applied at double effectiveness to the middle explosion and at quadruple effectiveness to the largest explosion. This tells me that the way that I'm adding damage to this, it's not just a flat increase to the spell, it's adding successively with the spell's actual style. The smallest explosion has a freeze rate of 40, the middle, the middle of 70, and the largest of 140. Added spell damage applies at 100, 175, and 350, respectively, for first, middle, and largest explosions. So, it's not necessarily crucial that you know this stuff, but it's just a nice way to know that, okay, well, how do I really make this, oh, okay, this is how I really kind of tool this thing to make it better. This is how I, that's how I influence it. This is how I can remove and change these scaling tags by using these skill specializations we just went over, right? We took a look at Fireball. It would remove the fire scaling tag from this and add lightning instead. So knowing these things, how these work and these scaling tags and what this all means is just kind of cr crucial for you. Uh, traversal skills too. Using a traversal skill puts all other traversal skills on cooldown and traversal skills cooldowns do not recover while you are using a traversal skill. This is important for some classes that can take their skills and morph them into one. An example would be if you're a void knight, you can change your void cleave into a traversal skill. If you are a primalist, your storm crows can be uh, morphed into a traversal skill. And these are just examples though I think if I, I don't know if this will, no, I, I, some of these will have, like I said, I don't think any, I don't know off the top of my head, any of the mage ones that, that possibly morph, but just knowing that sometimes these things will have something that, that might give them 
a morph into a traversal capability. That's just important to know so that you don't accidentally have two traversal skills on your bar. Here you go. So this focus ability gets morphed into a traversal skill. So having focus on my bar and teleport and focus being a traversal skill means that if I use one, it locks me out of using the other, especially while it's being and while it's active. So that's just an important note about traversal skills. You probably won't need to worry about that, but it's still worth bringing up. So, you know, in the, in the scope of a beginner's guide, right? And also, too, when you look at these skills, you can see the damage types that they are and the damage types that they can be. So fireball, for example, this is a fire damage ability, but it can be lightning. Snap freeze is cold and it can be lightning. Lightning is lightning, but it can be cold. And so on and so forth here for like frost claw, which can be morphed into fire or lightning flame ward, which is fire and can be cold or lightning. So anytime you see these icons on anything, you might see a fist, which represents uh, a lot of weird things at a weird party, but it also represents physical damage. If you're playing an acolyte, you're going to see the these icons for necrotic and poison damage. So if you're playing a void knight, you're going to see the void damage icon. So just know these things when you take a look at your skills because that's just giving you a heads up. Oh, that's what I can morph it into? Well, that's really cool. I've always wanted to use Rune Bolt or I've always wanted to use Glyph Domination or Dominion. How can I How can I make this work for my build? Oh, I'm drawing a fire build, blah, 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 blah. That's what I mean. This kind of just gives you a heads up while you're taking a look at the skills. So take a look at what skills you're playing with. You're playing with minions, anything like that. Just hold down Alt and figure out all of your scalings and how they work. Just a quick note on shrines, you're going to find them throughout your gameplay. Sometimes they'll give you items, sometimes they'll give you gold, sometimes they'll give you boons. This one gave me crit strike, so I can see it right here, hover over it, shows me the, the information lower right. Anytime you use more than one shrine, it will not overwrite the other. The effect will stack. So any kind of buffs or anything that's active, you're going to see over here in the UI. And sometimes you'll get a little weird bugged out dialogue that'll pop up in the lower right. But any kind of buffs that you're going to get from passives, from skills, from shrines, they're all going to appear right here, right above your health. Um, but kind of a fun thing to know about. So at this point, you've probably now made it into town and you have access to vendors, stashes, and your inventory. Let's go over all that real quick. So first off is our stash. Now your stash has two different things. You have a category at the top here, which you can add infinite amounts of. And then you've got a stash tab at the bottom. Now stash tab, you can kind of think of it as a subcategory if you want. But stash tabs cost money. It starts at one grand and it will scale up and it'll become more and more and more and more. And once you buy them, I can't unfortunately afford one right now. Um, you can right click on them and you can configure them. So let's just say that it says, uh, sorted like waiting waiting or to be sorted and then i can go ahead and press this button and there we go that's my to be sorted tab anything that i pick up in the middle of like going through stuff i can just go ahead and shift right click and throw it over there and then when i've got the time i can go ahead and put it into any of these categories like maybe this category over here is going to be uniques unique and set items Set that to like a cool color, right? Uh, none of these colors are cool. <laughs> do like that. Okay, let's do this one. This one's gonna be uh, exalted. I'll put like that there and that color, and boom, there we go. Those are my exalted items. And then from that, I can actually add the little tabs to any of these, right? I would put something here like scaling like certain levels because uniques can have set levels. Whatever it is, it's all right there. Do it as you see fit. It is a shared stash across any character that isn't either on your legacy or on cycle. Cycle being season, of course, right? And we have the ability to sort this. We can search it. So if I want to search for, you know, hide boots, found them. And it can, it's going to go across the entire tab, whatever I want it to do. And I'm going to configure that tab from here. So lots of fun to be having the stash. It's going to be up to you and how you want to do it. So, you know, you can have this little button too to kind of jump through quick views. Mine's all sorted kind of similar to this on my on my legacy account. This is cycle, so it's kind of a setup in a little diff bit of a different way. Outside of that, though, we have our actual inventory. And through the inventory, we have lots of things that we can do. I'm going to move all these goodies back here. I'm actually going to put some. So when I take a look at these items, open up the stash and oily in the middle of the video, I can see, hey, here's the Pyromancer's Rowan Wand. 
Rowan Wand is the base item. This is Wand. It's got a base attack, spell damage, and spell cost. Those things are the implicits of the item. Spell damage and spell cost specifically. Now at the bottom, I see 8% increased fire damage. That is an affix. Specifically, a suffix. So if I go ahead, uh, we're going to go into this more later. I'm sorry, specifically a prefix. But if I hover this and bring this over here, it shows me it's in the prefix slot. The reason I know that that is a prefix is you can see the little tiny icon to the left of 18%, that little arrow, that tells me that it is a prefix. If it was on the other side of the, the menu, no, no, nothing. Don't have a single suffix on any of these items. But if it was on the other side, it would be a suffix. Meaning, of course, it would just be the other two. So you have two prefix and two suffix slots for the majority of the game. There's instances where you can change those things, but that's not neither here nor there. But on top of this, we can see more information. So let's down, hold down Alt. Okay, cool. Because what the hell is increased fire damage, really? Well, it's pretty obvious. So that's not really a good example. But uh, yeah, all these are pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Okay, here's a good one. What is dodge rating? Improves your chance to dodge. Or chance to haste for one second on hit. Haste is a buff that grants 30% increased movement speed. Haste does not stack. So holding down alt gives me all the information I want here, right? Like armor. Armor reduces the damage you take from all hits, but not damage over time. More effective against physical damage. So these little bits of information are crucial to understanding the game. Now I can then hold down control. And alt and control together will show me the range in which things can roll. So for a specific... Let's take a look at these, the prefix on this item, or the affixes. I have 18% increased fire damage. Well, the range is 10 to 21%, and that's really good. So, hey, cool, good um, roll on that affix. But it also tells me the tier. Now, tiers on the affix shards can roll 1 to 5 from items that you can craft and manipulate and upgrade. Exalted items are tier 6. You will only get tier 6 shards from drops. So that's important to know, but not so much in the beginning. Don't even worry about it. And if I want, I can just simply hold down control, to just simply control to compare two items. And it shows me in green uh, what I'm gaining or, or losing from having one item over her. So I wanted to kind of bring this up because it's a really big portion of the game. You're going to be doing this a lot. But just to let you know, that's how this all works out. And you have all your respective slots and where everything goes. And one thing I will tell you, too, let's come over here to the armor merchant. Don't really worry about buying and selling. Uh, gold in this game is used for two things. Buying runes of shattering and buying more stash tabs. Yeah, it's also used for a certain vault and stuff like that. But that's that's a, that, that's when you have so much money, you don't know what to do with it. That you don't really need to worry about. And you can gamble in this game if you want, but don't really worry about it. For the most part, if you can't use anything, you're either going to try to Rune of Shatter it later into the game or just simply sell it like I'm going to do. Because having the money right now at the very beginning of your play is all you're going to worry about. You just want to get the money to buy these. And if you see this for, for two grand and you only have two grand, don't worry about it. You don't need to buy it. As you scale through the game, you'll be buying nothing but these. You're like, oh man, I should have bought more when I was when I was, when I was younger, you damn kids. But like right now, just don't worry about it. And you can buy back if you want. Cool thing about the buyback, if you log off, this is going to stay here. I hadn't played for like six months, and my old buyback was still there. So this is like pretty much always going to be there. But that covers all of our inventory, our merchants, our, our stashes. Let's keep going through our campaign. All right, you've now probably progressed to this character where you've gotten your first side quest. Up to this point, you've been dealing with the main story quests. And they're going to represent themselves over here. This little icon typically denotes that it is the main story quest versus this one, which is going to show you that it's a side quest. And you can press this to hide and show basically your journal. And you're going to press M or this button to bring up the map. Now the map is going to show you everything. The map has got a lot of information here too. So if you see an icon that looks like this or this or this or this or this or this, all these mean something. And essentially, if it's got this icon, there's a waypoint that you can get in that location. If it's like this, there's no waypoint. You just have to simply progress through it. This is telling me, you know, there's waypoints there I can jump to if I want. And then there's these icons that tell me, hey, this is the main story quest. This is a side quest, which is then reflected over in this area. And you can pin these if you want, and you can click them, and it shows you where they are, all this action, and it shows you rewards, anything like that. 
What's important to note here is that you can jump to different portions of the map here like this, if you so wish, and end of time, if you're a Chrono Trigger fan, this game is basically Chrono Trigger. Um, you can see this at the lower left, passive points rewards and idle slot rewards. So as you progress through the game, you're going to get 15 passive points and eight idle slots strictly through side quests. This does not include the passive points and stuff like that you'll get through the main quest. In fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So this is just kind of a quick crash course on this. You're going to be jumping through this as you would any other kind of map. And the maps are pretty large, as you can see here. If I zoom all the way out, I can simply jump over here to jump into it or press space bar to reset me back to where my main character is. But just wanted to give you a quick little crash course on on your quests and your side quests because there's going to be points where you will get a quest and you're not going to know where that side quest is. If you look up here, it'll show you, oh, hey, well, that's where the side quest is. Well, let's go to the Imperial Era to do that or the Divine or Ancient or Ruined, whatever it is. And also, too, don't worry too much about going out of the way to do the side quest it's almost always a part of the path like for example here we're right here we're going to get something that's going to tell us to go to the northern road but the storerooms is where this side quest is so it's usually just a little step away um if i think i can see the other portion no i think it's imperial era nope nope maybe so maybe not uh ruined era that's where it is for example too you'll come over to this portion of the map and it'll go, oh, you're going to go to Last Archive. Well, we want you to go here, but there's a side quest here. Or we were, we were going to be coming down this direction, and then this direction. There's a side quest over here, but I want you to go over here. Like, you're not going to miss the side quests. They're very much a part of just the progression of the game. So don't get too lost in the side quests, but do make sure you knock them out so you can get everything completed and unlocked for your character. We just hit level 7 with this character, and depending on what type of character you're playing, what class, everything like that, you should have roughly gotten some sort of defensive capability. And we're going to go over some defensive capabilities, so the main thing we want to talk about is endurance and wards. Those are two defensive characteristics that all characters can tap into, but some characters can actively do so or differently than others. So, for example, here, I'm on my mage, and my mage has flame ward, grants a burst of 400 ward, then, for three seconds, hits deal 30% less damage to you and cause a retaliatory burst of flames. What the hell is a ward? We're going to hover over our health bar, our health globe, or paunch of health, whatever the hell. And this shows us our health, our maximum, our health regeneration rate. And the same thing here we're going to find over here on our um, mana. Oh, I, never mind. I thought that showed me. My mana re regeneration rate is in here somewhere. Mana regen. Ah, there it is. Mana regeneration is up there by eight. Um, what we're going to see are two fields, ward and endurance. So ward absorbs damage before health, has no cap, and decays over time. Decay occurs more quickly the more wards you have. So let's go ahead and take a look here. This little bar right here is going to be the ward. It's kind of empty right now, right? So I'm going to go ahead and press my flame ward. You can see it's going down. Then it slows down its descent. And you can see my health is all like frozen there, right? It shows me until... No ward takes forever to get to zero. <laughs> so we have no ward left. But in that time, that would have been my health that it would have taken. So this basically gives me a burst of 400 health, let's just say. And in that time, too, you can see ward retention reduces the rate of ward decay. So I can actually influence. I'm going to go ahead and press R here. I'm going to hover back over. Oh, that's kind of bugged. Well, it should show you my current ward. Um, but you can you can affect the the retention of that ward, you know, how fast it decays using ward retention, which is an item modifier, I think, very on items and or skills uh, that you can find here and there. But endurance is another very interesting kind of survivable or type of survivability type thing, defensive thing. So endurance reduces damage dealt to your health below your endurance threshold, does not reduce damage dealt to ward. So what you're going to see is there's going to be items that say increased endurance, and that's calculated as a damage percent reduction. So my endurance threshold, endurance is active below this health value. I have 156 health below at 31 health or lower, basically where this bar is, where that little line is, I'm going to have a 20% damage reduction. So I can increase my endurance through items. I don't think I have a single... Oh, 
I don't think I have a single item that does that. It's kind of more of a, a later thing that you'll see. Um, okay, I didn't think so. But you'll be able to reduce this damage amount or increase this endurance threshold either by items, by skills, by passives, by whatever. But it's just important to know these things because you're going to start to get to your defensive capabilities. You're going to wonder if you should specialize in it. Are you playing a Sentinel who has lots of different ways to tap into stuff like endurance? Or Primalists as well have a lot of ways to kind of play with these abilities more. As you can see as a mage, I have a direct use with a Flame Ward. So just kind of know that these things exist because they are important, crucial portions of the defensive characteristics of your character. But I wanted to kind of have its own section on this to talk about. Now, at this point in the game, you've probably gotten your first rune, your first affix, or your first glyph. And you'll see I've got a rune of shattering here. We're going to go ahead and pick it up. I'm going to press my inventory. And you can see that I've got these two little ditties. I've got a health regen shard, which is an affix shard, is the name of it. And I've got a rune of shattering. I do not have any glyphs. And you can see that these are then reflected by these respective pools right here. So I don't need these to occupy my inventory space. I can just press this button. And this material pool is relevant for all of my characters on this server, I guess you could call it. If it's legacy, it's present for all legacy characters. If it's cycle, it's present for all your cycle characters, which will eventually become legacy. And like we said earlier, we just simply click this button and we can see all the active uh, glyphs if we have any, runes if we have any, our affix shards that we would then use with the crafting portion we'll go into once we get to that point in the campaign. But I wanted to bring those up because you will discover them before they maybe become a little bit more pertinent or valuable to you because you haven't jumped into crafting yet. But don't sell them. Don't worry about getting rid of them or moving them to your stash. Just press transfer materials and they'll pop into this really cool little exclusive stash, you know, a VIP list and all that kind of fun action. We just hit level eight and we unlocked a second spell specialization or skill specialization. And I'm going to quickly do some tinkering here. So for one, I'm going to put my mana strike up in this little slot and I'll probably put mana gain per, per point. That looks fine to me. And yeah, we'll do another one. Sure. But I'm going to come back here to fireball and I'm going to respec and despecialize this skill. Remove it. And I'm going to put Glacier up here because I've now unlocked Glacier and it's quite a good ability. So you can kind of see here by, by kind of like looking at everything, we've gone ahead and um, put points into stuff. We've removed things and we've set a new skill up. So accelerated XP gain until level two, just to kind of bring it up to snuff with the rest of the build. So like I said, you can despecialize and you can remove skills and all this stuff and don't feel like all of a sudden you're behind some sort of curve. You're just fine to keep going. So now that we've got that all squared away, let's just keep plugging away. So you just hit level 10 and with level 10, your minimum skill level is increased. So this dictates how many skill points your skills start with when you specialize in them and how many skill points will be retained when deleveling a skill. We've gone through all this all before, but as you level up, your minimum skill level will also increase periodically. I don't know if this is on a set certain interval. Like I said, I have a level 76 character who's... Um, Minimum skill level is six. So I don't know if it's every 10 levels it goes up by one or something like that, starting with like one up until 10 or whatever. But just a heads up, you're probably going to hit this menu and it's letting you know that, hey, now your minimum specialized skill level has increased by one. So at this point in this game, you've probably now reached a point where you've got a good amount of skills, a good amount of things going on, and there's a lot of resource management you need to deal with. One of the things I want to focus on in this little section is about mana management. Now, your mana is going to replenish at whatever replenishment rate that you have set, whatever it is. But in most video games, when you have a mana pool, zero is your baseline, right? You cannot go below zero. And if you do not have the minimum amount of mana to cast something, then you cannot cast it. So for example, I have 70 total mana and Glacier costs me 54 mana to cast. I'm going to cast it. Oh, now it's going up very quickly. And you can see that I have all the way back to 70. Well, I'm going to cast this twice in succession. And what you'll notice with Last Epoch is you can actually dip into the negative. As long as you have positive mana, you can use that mana to push you into the negative. So watch this. All right, see how we're in negative? It's draining back down, and now it's going back up. So the game will allow you to dip into the negative, and what you have to do in that meantime is either wait for it to regenerate or use an ability such as this to replenish mana to yourself. So 
you might look at these things and kind of tell yourself, well, what does that negative mean? How is it affecting me? How does it all work? It just means that you had one out of 70 mana in my specific instance, and you cast Glacier. So now you're 53 into the negative. So the game now has to let you replenish that through your natural means, or you have to forcibly replenish it by using something like Mana Strike. Now, this won't be this won't be uh, used on every single character, but a lot of characters will have some form of um, resource management they have to manage, and there will always be a way to jump into the negative, and you just have to simply push yourself into the positive. As you've continued your quest, you've now probably made it to the council chambers in the Ruined Era, and you'll encounter this character right here. Looks a lot like me, they're bald. So you'll click them, and this character is going to allow you to re-specialize any of your mastery points. So any of those passives that you have invested into your character, you can now respect them here. And you can see if I click this one little here, it'll tell me it's going to cost me 90 gold to respect this specific node. Just keep in mind something that you can respect the entire list if you want. And something I didn't really talk about in the passive section, but it's worth noting. Right now I have 18 invested points into my base mage passive once i get to the 20 point i'm gonna want to hold off investing my master or my my passive points until i unlock my mastery typically the way a lot of build guides will tell you how to build your build out is by putting 20 points into your initial uh passive switching to whatever your specific mastery is going to be and invest them into that a specific mastery up to you know 35 or whatever it is it's usually going to be something synergistic with your skills and passives you want to unlock but if as a general rule of thumb for your own build when you're making one just put 20 points into here and if you haven't unlocked your mastery yet and you've got extra points just hold on to them they're not going to go anywhere um, and if you have that kind of ocd and you don't like seeing this just simply bring up your passive screen and close it again but General kind of rule of thumb there, get 20 points here and then invest the rest into your specific mastery and come back and finish off anything here in the general passive tree if you need to. Once you reach the armory, you're going to encounter one of the last big mechanics to learn about the game, and that is crafting. So you'll go ahead and talk to this guy and he'll be like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And you'll have this little forge. And I don't know why it looks like a chest. It's a weird bug right now, but that opens up your forge to start crafting. You can conversely just simply press F on your keyboard and bring up the forge. So you don't need to be near a forge. You can do this at any point in the game from any location. Don't worry about it. But from here, I have a whole entire video breaking this entire system down. But let me just give you a real quick crash course in it so you at least understand as far as continuity for the video itself. So when you take a look at this, um, I'm going to go ahead and bring one of these items into the slot. And the reason I've chosen this item is because it has two prefixes and two suffixes. And the item right here has a certain forging potential you can find at the top. Forging potential is randomly rolled per item. Every single item you find is not going to have the same forging potential. And so if take, for example, this one, it has a forging potential of 16. Here's the same item type. It has a forging potential of 18. Here's the same item type with another 16. And here's another one with 14. So it will be different depending upon... Whatever it is, that roll happens and it's set. But I want you to think of that forging potential as kind of a currency that you're going to use for the item and what it can kind of uh, pull from. So what I mean by that is if I want to upgrade, say, this specific affix, it's going to cost me 1 to 10 forging potential. And from there, you can use these little buttons to upgrade the specific ones. And there's going to be a set limit. You cannot traverse beyond a set tier based off of your level. So, for example, again, if I'm level 70 or something, I won't be able to go above tier 6. Um, and you can only craft to a certain range as well. It's going to increase the level requirement for the item if you do so, and it'll tell you, hey, you can't use this. So, let's go ahead and take a look at this tier 2 health. And you can swap these ones out. You can put on different ones, like say, for example, this one that doesn't have the other uh, prefixes and suffixes set. I can add them manually, like this. Press prefix and like that and add whatever ones I want manually. Um, and I, my mistake, by the way, when I'm talking about upgrading, it's you can't go above tier five. Tier six is and seven you only find. But if I want to add these manually, I definitely can. Or you can use stuff like glyphs. Glyphs are great ways to either manipulate an item or completely shatter an item. 
So we've got a glyph of discovery here. I'm sorry, a rune of discovery. Glyphs are these right here. Rune of discovery. Even though this looks more like a glyph to me. But a rune of discovery is going to discover one random tier one affix to all empty affix slots on the item. So if I press this button, it's going to add three affixes. What's nice about that is it did not cost me any forging potential, but it's three random affixes, but they have a chance also of being rarer affixes. So it's a great way to kind of farm affixes onto an item that you intend on blowing up. Now, what does blowing up mean? It just so happens that this added two affixes that I kind of like, intelligence and cast speed, fire resistance, endurance is whatever. So items, you're going to primarily use a rune of shattering to blow them up. Now, there are two ways to remove affixes from items. You can blow it up and get the affix shards randomly. It says right here, destroy an item, creating a random number of affix shards containing its powers. Or you can press remove. There's a remove rune right there, and it will randomly remove a single affix shard and all of its uh, um constituents <laughs> poison of my constituents if it's a tier four shard it'll remove all the shards that it, that it includes so in this instance here i'm going to go ahead and blow up this item and this is going to give me a chance to get one two three four affix shards one two three or four just depends so we're going to blow it up oh we got the cast speed and the fire resistance shards that's it um but Let's go ahead and take a look back at these gloves. And we're going to take a look at this health. So we've we've looked at runes. And a good way to do this, is, think about this, is that runes do something other than forging using the forge. And the glyph is basically a modify of a forging role in some way. Huge shout out to Lost Partridge for that little bit of information. So, for example here, we're going to increase the tier on health. And I'm going to go ahead and use a Glyph of Hope. This is the only way you can really kind of help circumvent forging potential cost. It's either by a critical success or using this. So I'm going to click this little guy right here. It loads it up. It's going to have a 25% to have this cost no forging potential penalty for me. So I'm going to press upgrade. You can see it costs 1 to 12 with 32 forge remaining. Boom. We upgraded it to tier 3. It cost me 11, unfortunately. Uh, but we still got this up to tier 3 health. And you can see now, I can't go higher. Requires level 23 to forge. Because now this thing has a set level requirement of 11. Because we put a tier 3 health shard onto it. So there's a lot of ways that you're going to use and influence forging. And forging is a very, very big part of this game. This is really just a really quick crash course. And it's 6 minutes long. But... I have a whole video that's much longer and goes into way more in depth on this situation, but I just wanted to give you a quick little briefing on it. You can find that linked in the upper right corner, in the description, and in the pinned comment. But pretty much for the most part, you don't need to really worry about forging as you're leveling up unless you really know what you're doing. You're really just going to be destroying items more or less for the, the shards that you want. So, like maybe this one here. Okay, this is going to give me intelligence and cast speed. Let's just go ahead and blow that bad boy up. Okay, I got an intelligence shard. You just kind of want to use blowing up uh, runes to build your stockpile of shards for the later portion of the game where you will be using them in mass. And that's why I said the biggest focus on money until you join a guild is going to be primarily used to buy runes of shattering and buy your stash tabs. All right, so if you're looking forward to finally getting your mastery online, what you're going to want to get to is this point in the campaign. Saving Last Refugee, find Elder companion on in the lower district so we're going to go ahead and complete this quest and it's going to lead to the end that will give us our mastery so if you're like oh what level do i get my mastery this is what is going to be the saving grace so pretty much right after the armory in the lower district so you just dealt with that boss now you get to the end of time and you're in your full chrono trigger arc so you're going to talk to this guy and you're going to set up your you're gonna, yeah, uh -huh. you're gonna choose your mastery. So from this screen, okay, Cock Blockula, I'm trying to make a video here. So you've got your mastery. You choose one of these three, and it's gonna show you stuff like passive bonuses or stuff like this, stuff like this, stuff like this. So what you're gonna want to know though 
is that, like I said before in the skill section, but just to reiterate, is that this mastery choice is going to give you a set skill that you can no way unlock with the other one. So I'm going to be going here with Rune Master, which is going to give me a 30% increased elemental damage and 10% increased cast speed with elemental spells, but it gives me Runic Invocation. That's a big portion of this. And remember too, when I press this button, it's going to say, hey, choosing a mastery is final and cannot be undone or changed. You can specialize or respec or change pretty much everything in this game for the exception of your mastery. It is locked in. You can't do anything about it. So let me just, I, I, I get like paranoid right here. I'm going to choose this again just to make sure I chose Rune Master. And now we've set this all up. We're good to go. We're going to open up our skills. And we can see that that once, which had this icon right there, it is now unlocked for us. And just to reiterate one more time, bringing up our passive tree, you now see that this branches down from our parent tree into our mastery. And that chain that was here is gone. But if I click on Spellblade, it's still there. So you can invest any amount of points that you want, but you cannot go beyond this chain in Spellblade or Sorcerer if you've chosen Rune Master or you know, vice versa for any of the opposites here. This is what's going to allow me to unlock the Rune Bolt or Glyph of Dominion if I'm a Rune Master or Firebrand and Surge if I'm a Spellblade or Arcane Ascendance and Black Hole if I'm a Sorcerer, whatever it is. So now that you've selected your mastery, you pretty much know everything that this game has to offer you. And you're pretty much set to keep moving forward. And with that, it brings our video here to a close. So we've covered pretty much everything that you're going to be doing as a beginner in this game. Now, there are some things that maybe I didn't go fully in depth on because there is a little bit of discovery element that I want you to have. And at the end of the game, too, like there's stuff like the item guilds and the echoes and monoliths. That's all going to happen after the campaign ends. And by that time, it should be pretty self-explanatory about how those work. It's a very straightforward system. And I'll have set videos on those so that you can jump into them as that um, kind of approaches for you. So hopefully this, like I said, was able to educate you on the mechanics as you encounter them versus just overwhelming you with just a massive amount of information up front. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below if you need help with anything or if there's any things that you maybe missed or you're like, hey, you know, you said that this mechanic works like this, but it's not really jumping out 100% that way. Can you help me out here? Or maybe if you have played this game before, and there's some big hot tips that I didn't cover. Like I didn't talk anything about gambling. Gambling is a very big trap in the game don't mess around with it i know if you're probably coming from diablo you're used to doing a lot of gambling in diablo 2 with, with uh, agreed don't do it here it's not it's not recommended so if you have any really hot tips or good suggestions for people that maybe as a veteran or, or, or as a beginner that you really wish you had known to start with go ahead and let it be known below but as always guys thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care